Hello everyone, it is me, Glenn Kyle, at the Northeast Georgia History Center on this beautiful Thursday, May the 14th, and today we are going to be talking about the history of the duel. Now, we uh, had a, a talk about Hamilton, and that has created a lot of interest in that, but, but first we need to understand what do we mean by a duel. So a duel is usually a, an agreed upon set of violence between two people, and by agreed upon, I mean that they are not just starting into a fight, they're not getting into a brawl somewhere. It's very organized. It follows a predetermined and agreed upon set of rules. Uh, it uses sp uh, specific types of weapons. And it's set up really so that, uh, at least on the surface, one person does not have a distinct advantage over the other. Now, this is a very uh, violent subject. This is something where people are using physical violence to try to solve a problem or to address an issue. And this has been going on throughout all of human history. But what makes a duel different? This is not a battle. This is, this is not between armies. These are between individuals. And they had different types of duels through history, going all the way back to the first written records that we have, these ancient civilizations of, of Ur and Babylon and ancient Greece and ancient Rome, when people had disputes they needed to settle sometimes if there was no other way to do it, if the law did not provide a recourse or didn't provide the recourse that the two parties wanted to arrive at, then they would agree to a duel. And of course, laws have been put in place to sort of try to control this. So there are different kinds of duels. The first, one of the first kinds was actually a, um, a judicial duel. And so if there was some wrong uh, legally that had happened, or if someone had been accused of a particular crime by the state, rather than demanding a, a trial by their peers or a trial by the king, they could demand a trial by combat. And the court would determine exactly how that combat was to be. Uh, the court might have a representative, and the representative of the court and the accused would then have a battle. And it was usually to the death because it was believed that higher powers would be in control of the combat. And if the accused would, was innocent, then, then he or she would be helped in battle by that higher power and would be victorious. If they were guilty in the eyes of the higher power, then the uh, appointee by the court would, of course, win the battle, killing that person, and then that would be it. So uh, judicial duels have, have come to be something that is definitely within our past, and they occurred all the way up through the medieval period and maybe even to the early modern period when people would try to declare, well, I want to be, uh, I, I demand a trial by combat. I want to fight my way out of this rather than depend upon the outcome of a court of law. These are illegal now. We haven't had a uh, trial by combat in quite some time, but it was a very, very popular form of duel. And in the Middle Ages, sometimes if there were issues between uh, domestic disputes, there are examples of uh, men and women who would get into legal disputes and it would be settled with the trial by combat. But to make it even, they would perhaps, they, this is one instance, there are some illustrations of this that look really interesting. They would dig a, a, a pit about waist deep for the man to stand in, and then the woman would be outside the pit, and they figured that that would sort of counterbalance the, the usually overwhelming, not overwhelming, but greater physical strength that a man would have over a woman, and this is how the, the combat would go. So those are, are, are judicial duels. What happens in the Middle Ages is we start to see duels of honor. And, of course, the great question is, what is honor? Honor is very hard to describe. It is a person's social standing. It is their perception of trustworthiness and friendliness and value within a society. Their social standing, uh, you know, are they high class, low class? Do they, uh, can they be trusted? Can they not be trusted? And so this sense of honor became a very, very important point. And people would have duels over the honor in the Middle Ages. It could be on foot with swords. Uh, there, there could be joust, right? A joust technically is a duel. It is a fight between two people who have agreed to a certain set of rules and a certain set of weapons on a certain day at a certain time, and they get on their horses, and they ride at each other with their lances, and they try to, to, to hit each other. Sometimes this was done for sport. 
and the lances would be dulled on the tip so that they wouldn't actually hopefully cause damage. But sometimes these were real duels and the, the weapons would be sharpened and they would be uh, to the death. And so moving, and this was, however, duels at this point, duels of honor, of course, would be limited to the upper classes. And it was really only a, a gentlemanly or an upper class sort of thing that gave you the right to appeal to a duel, uh, to, a, to a trial of honor, because the common people couldn't have as much honor, and, and anything that a common person would do, first of all, would be considered crass and rude, and that would just be no more than a brawl. And second, if you weren't a gentleman, you really couldn't understand what it was to have honor, and you couldn't be relied upon to follow the, ro the rules of the duel. So it sort of becomes a middle to upper class situation, especially in Europe and especially in Great Britain. And this practice, of course, flowers, especially in France and Great Britain, in the uh, 1700s and in the 1800s. There are entire books written about duels, especially in Great Britain. America, at least the, the United States, is a colony, is, a, is an output of that European tradition. So, of course, duels come to the New World as well. The first duel that we know of took place in Massachusetts since in the 1620s between two men who were having a, a disagreement or a dispute. And they continued to be fought, and they were generally frowned upon. Uh, and we'll get into why in a minute, some of the ramifications that could come from participating in a duel. What was, what was it all about? What did it accomplish? Uh, could it actually settle anything? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. And there have been some very, very famous duels in American history. Uh, one that we talk about here at the Northeast Georgia History Center because it's, it's an interesting piece of Georgia history is a duel between Button Gwinnett and Lachlan McIntosh. These are two men who were very fervent patriots during the American Revolution for the colony and then the state of Georgia. But they had very, they both had their own ambitions and they wanted very much to be able to lead the armies of Georgia and they couldn't decide who was going to be in charge of it. And they, they both were sort of in co-command of an expedition to go into British-held Florida. The expedition fell apart, it did not do well, and when they were forced to come to retreat back into Georgia, they had a, the uh, state legislature had an inquiry. And Lachlan McIntosh referred to Button Gwinnett as a scoundrel and a lying rascal. And when Gwinnett heard about this, of course, he had no choice but to challenge Lachlan McIntosh to a duel, and they agreed to come together, and they used pistols, and they were at, apparently, they had started back to back and went about four paces apart. That makes them only about 20 to 24 feet apart, so that's, that's pretty close. It's going to be hard to miss. They fire at each other. They both hit each other, but they don't think it's that serious, and, and since the duel has taken place, they've both been hit, then the matter of honor was considered settled. And yet, McIntosh heals of his wounds. Gwinnett dies a couple of days later in absolute agony. He was hit in the, in the thigh. And this causes a huge dispute amongst uh, George's politicians and even goes up to George Washington, who sort of has to, to settle the issue by sending McIntosh up north to command Continental Forces in North Carolina rather than leaving him in Georgia. As an interesting side note, Button Gwinnett, who was one of Georgia's signers of the Declaration of Independence, dies so early that of all the signatures that you could get from the Declaration of Independence, those original signers, his signature is worth the most amount of money on a collector's market because he simply didn't live long enough to sign very many documents. Once America's independence is won, of course, we have an entirely new nation. And this nation is, is not like the old world, right? We are all very egalitarian. We're equal. No man is better than another man. Well, what that means is that all men have um, recourse to a duel if they feel that their honor has been slighted. And this, this happens, uh, it, it doesn't happen as much in the North. It tends to happen more in the South, especially when you get into the early 19th century and the early 1800s. But it still happens and it takes place. And of course, probably the most famous duel takes place in 1804 between, you know, Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr over a dispute over uh, politics. Hamilton had said, I, I, don't, I don't believe that Burr can be trusted with the reins of government. And he had written this in a letter and sent it to a friend. The letter had become public. 
Burr had found out about it and considered this a great insult. And he demanded that Hamilton retract the statement. Hamilton said, I'm not going to retract the statement because it's true. Um, and so they begin this disagreement. They have uh, folks try to rectify the dispute. That fails, and they end up meeting. They have, uh, dueling in New York is illegal. And uh, as I said, they pass laws against dueling, but people still do it like crazy because it's a matter of honor. It's how you can prove your social worth and your social station. So they row across the river to New Jersey. They have their duel. Burr kills Alexander Hamilton in this duel, ending uh, Hamilton's life. And Burr's reputation from that point on is absolutely ruined. There's, there's no hope for him. And, and why is that? This is the interesting thing about duels, especially in America. They, they have laws against it trying to encourage people to not do them. As I said, it was considered illegal in New York, which means that, uh, and, if, and if, you were, uh, if you participated in a duel in New York, you basically had your rights of citizenship stripped. You could not vote. You could not hold public office any longer. Um, Aaron Burr, since he killed Alexander Hamilton in New Jersey, was wanted for murder in the state of New Jersey. Um, and so Burr has to leave. And every, a lot, well, not everyone, but a lot of people loved Alexander Hamilton. And because of that, because of all these other things, Aaron Burr, his political career is ruined after that. And he ends up dying in poverty about 30 years later. And he, he's not really able to, to do much more with his life. It, it's absolutely ruined. And that's, that's one of the, the great tragedies. There are probably no more tragic death to early Americans than the death of Alexander Hamilton, except, of course, for, perhaps for the, the natural deaths of folks like George Washington. So how did these men get into these duels? How did they actually go about it? Well, as, as many of uh, you were tuning in, we learned that in the musical uh, Hamilton, they talk about the duel between Burr and the protagonist, and there's a song about it that tells what the rules are of how to go about having a duel. And, and that's a pretty accurate song. There were definitely, well, there was a code. I don't want to say there were rules because it's a, it's a very interesting situation. Because if two men are having a dispute of honor over politics, over an insult, or if one has struck another, which was one of the most serious uh, transgressions of honor that you could have, they, as I said, they don't immediately begin throwing fists at each other because they're gentlemen. And so they step back and they do something called gathering their seconds. So a second, it's their second man. They have someone who will act on their behalf when it comes to this duel. And so the seconds tend to be the ones who are going back and forth, right? Um, so the seconds will then meet and they will say, well, um, subject A has insulted uh, subject B, and subject A would like to know if subject B would like to issue a public apology. And the other second will say, well, subject B does not wish to, um, uh, to give an apology for this. And he says, well, I'll go back and tell my man. And so this, this conversation could go on for some time because they're trying to keep it from coming to bloodshed. And so if, it, if, if neither party can agree on how to apologize or how to avoid the duel, then it's up to the seconds to set up the terms of the duel, where it will be, who will be involved, will they split the cost of the doctor, what will the weapons be, what will the rules of the duel be, and this is, this is why I say that there's, there, there are many published pamphlets about how to have a duel, but it really comes down to, based, you know, with, a, with certain parts of society and, and the dueling society that says what's okay and what's not, it's really what the seconds agree to. Uh, and the weapons could be different. Uh, the place they're going to meet could be different. The distances between the people using pistols could be different based on what the seconds agree to. And so... These seconds will then agree upon the place and the time. And it's interesting because the two people who have insulted each other, after this is set in motion, they really don't communicate very much with each other at all unless a, a formal apology is issued. Other than that, it's just the seconds going back and forth. And so when the day comes, they uh, bring sets of the weapons that have been agreed upon. In American history, it's usually pistols. 
and those seconds will then together load the pistol so that there's no trickery going on, right? This is all very, very formalized, and they want to make sure that everything is done just so. The, the seconds will together come and load the pistols. They'll take the pistols to the two parties, and then they will say once again, is there no way this can be settled without, without a duel? And at that, that's the last chance of, of the two parties to agree to not go to firing. And if they cannot agree, then they take up their positions, and upon a signal, they are supposed to both fire simultaneously. And there are lots of different rules, depending upon you know, which set you're using, how that could go. If your pistol misfires, if it doesn't work, that still counts. If you trip and, and, and it's called give your shot, if you, if you don't hit, that still counts, right? And the other person has a chance to shoot at you. And it was considered dishonorable to try to have any sort of advantage during this time. And so if someone is hit, usually it's considered that the duel will stop. And more often than not, that is enough to satisfy honor. Even if it's just a slight wound, they'll both agree that honor has been satisfied. Um, and then they will go on their way, and that's that. They may still have to deal with some of the legal ramifications and things like that, but, but honor has been satisfied. And that's really one of the terms that continue to be used is that someone will demand satisfaction. And so these duels become very, very common in the American South. One of the most famous duelists in early American history is, of course, Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson got involved in several duels in his, uh, in his younger days, and one of the most famous ones was with a fellow named Charles Dickens, who was, this was over a gambling debt over a horse race, and they could not agree on who owed who the money, and so they ended up setting a duel. And Dickinson was a fantastic shot with a pistol. Jackson was not bad, but Dickinson was a fantastic shot. And apparently on the way, as they were riding to the duel, to show off, Dickinson would, uh, would do some target practice from horseback. And there was a tavern sign that he knew Jackson was going to be riding by, and he shot one of the strings holding the sign up so that it was sort of akimbo. And he says, make sure you leave that that way and tell Jackson that I've done that when he comes by. And so Jackson is pretty sure that they're both going to, he's got to get off his, he either has to get off his shot quick or he's got to figure something out. So they arrive at the appointed time and place. They divide, they're only about uh, 20 to 30, they're about 25 feet apart. And they give the signal, which very often was just a handkerchief being dropped. And as soon as the handkerchief hits the ground, they're supposed to fire simultaneously. Dickinson, the excellent shot, immediately fires and Jackson doesn't move. And Dickinson said, great God, have I missed him? And Jackson slowly takes aim and shoots Dickinson in the head. And it's a mortal wound and Dickinson dies from that point. Little did they know that Dickinson's shot had actually hit Jackson in the chest, broken two ribs, and blood was pouring down the inside of his pants into his shoe. Blood began pooling up in his shoe and coming out. So these duels could be very, very violent, and, and, and lots of interesting things could happen. And uh, obviously very famous people in American history participated in these duels. Now, some of the weapons that they might use. Um, let me show you a couple of these. I'll go ahead and talk about this one. This one, uh, this is the small sword. This was a popular dueling weapon in colonial America and certainly in Great Britain. And, but, but uh, as, uh, after an independence, sword sort of fell out of fashion with the Americans, partially, not entirely, but partially because Americans considered themselves egalitarian and everyone is equal, right? Well, if you're going to fight with a sword, generally speaking, you need to know how to sword fight. You've had training. You might be good at it. You might have had a teacher. Not everyone is going to have that advantage. And so it was, so it was considered somewhat disadvantageous if you choose sword knowing your opponent could not sword fight. It wasn't fair, but so, so this was common. So this sword, again, this is a small sword. It's made to thrust, right? It is made to thrust at your opponent. It's not sharp on the edges, not sharp at all, but that point is like a needle. And so the two men would come together and they would fight. 
And the rules could be just to the first blood. If you nick your opponent and there's blood, satisfaction could be determined. If they decide that it's going to be the, to the death, then it's going to continue to be to the death. And so this sword is very much something that's more elegant. There's lots of illustrations. There's lots of stories about sword fighting. But again, not so much in the early United States. Sword fighting has fallen out of style. What you really have is a, is a single shot flintlock pistol. I'll come a little bit closer so that you can see this one. Um, it's a, it's a, again, it's a muzzle loader. It's a single shot and it's a flintlock. So you have here a piece of flint and a steel. And what you would do is you would put a little powder in here, just like our regular flintlock and close that up. Then you would put your powder and your ball in the muzzle and they all have these ramrods. You would put that down. Now remember the seconds are doing this so they're going to be very, very careful to make sure that the pistol works really well for their guy. And then it's going to be time. They'll pull it back to full cock and now see if you can see the spark. Did you see that? So that spark is going to go down into the pan and set the powder off. And usually, right, these pistols come in pairs. They're sold in pairs because they're a dueling pistol set. It's generally going to be two people. And so you're going to take your place. You'll, your second will hand you your pistol. And then you will, you, this is at half cock, right? Right now it's at half cock. It's on safety. If I pull the trigger, it doesn't do anything. And so we will take our space. And then when they get the signal ready, we'll cock it. And then when they say aim, we will level our pistol. And we will aim at each other. And then when the signal is given, you have to stand there until it's time to fire. There were a couple of interesting things that, that you could do to perhaps make yourself safe. Uh, instead of standing like this, which makes your body a wider target, you could stand this way, which might make it a little more narrow. Uh, some rules said that you should not do this, but if you did this, it would be a little bit of a barrier against your heart, so you wouldn't have to... Um, it, it, the, ball, the ball might not have as much power after going through your hand. Um, but for example, if, I, if I'm doing my target and I go like this and it doesn't fire, that's my shot. I then am bound by honor to simply stand there and take my opponent's fire, right? This could be incredibly unnerving. And because of this unnerving aspect of things, it took a lot for someone to get to this point. Most people were able to solve their issues before it came to this. And sometimes, um, in England, it's a little bit different, and I want to read a passage about that in just a second. In England, really the point is to get to the duel, right? Not necessarily to harm your opponent, but to sh you, you show your courage by just getting to the point where you're standing there holding weapons next to each other. And then sometimes you may just put your gun and, and fire the gun into the ground, and that would be that. The Duke of Wellington himself has a duel in the 1820s very much like that. There's a disagreement between him and an earl. It goes back and forth, and they finally get to the point where they're standing face to face with pistols. And they decide, their, I should say their seconds decide beforehand, they will not actually fire at each other. They simply fire into the ground, and honor is satisfied. Now, a couple of things. Um, again, the differences between England and America are become obvious between the two countries as the, as the newspapermen are writing about the stories. We've got a great book here. It's called The Duel, A History, and it's by a fellow named Robert Baldick. And there's a couple of passages I want to share with you. I hope you will indulge me. Um, but Alexis de Tocqueville, that great Frenchman who came to America in the 1830s, uh, who came to America in the 1830s, um, remarked upon this. And he said, in Europe, one hardly ever fights a duel except in order to be able to say that one has done so. The offense is generally a sort of moral stain which one wants to wash away and which most often is washed away at little expense. In America, one only fights to kill. One fights because one sees no hope of getting one's adversary condemned to death. There are very few duels 
but they almost all end fatally. So even a uh, foreign observer is going to see that in America, they're able to settle, settle the differences usually, but when it comes to the duel, someone or two people are going to die. Um, and in America, there's a common thing where they're trying to goad another person into it, right? Um, not just by saying, you're, you know, you're bad, but this is called posting. So someone will go and post a letter in a public area. They may put an ad in a newspaper. And for example, here's one um, where two congressmen were having a, a tuffle, and one wanted to get the other one into a duel. He wanted to be able to shoot at him. He couldn't just walk up onto the street and murder him. That's crazy. But if you get them into a duel, it's considered honorable. So he has a notice posted throughout Washington City that says, in justice to my character, I denounce to the world John Randolph, a member of Congress, as a prevaricating, base, calumnating scoundrel, poltroon, and coward. Ladies and gentlemen, have you ever heard such language from us here at the Northeast Georgia History Center? Um, so this is the sort of thing that people would publish, and there's no way honorably to ignore that. Uh, you are going to have to move forward with the code duello. And, and again, the most famous uh, duelist of them all, Alexander Hamilton, he leaves a letter shortly after, uh, or excuse me, right before he goes to the duel that ends his life. And he despises dueling. His son had died in a duel three years before, so he hates it. And he leaves this letter saying, this is, this is why I don't want to do it. And this is this is incredibly poignant. First, my religious and moral principles are strongly opposed to the practice of, practice of dueling, and it would ever give me pain to shed the blood of a fellow creature in private combat forbidden by the laws. Second, my wife and children are extremely dear to me, and my life is of the most importance to them in various views. In other words, if I die, they're not going to have an income. They're not going to have a living. There's going to be no one to take care of them. Thirdly, I feel a sense of obligation towards my creditors who, in case of accident to me by forced sale of my property, may, be, may in some degree suffer. So bless his heart, it's Hamilton, the financial whiz, who's always thinking about money. He's afraid that he's not going to be able to pay his debts back and his creditors might run into financial trouble. Fourth, I am conscious of no ill will to Colonel Burr, distinct from political opposition, which, as I trust, has proceeded from pure and upright motives. In other words, we differ about politics all the time. That's what politics is. So why has it come to the point where Burr feels that we must try to kill each other to, to reach some sort of understanding? And then finally, I shall, and this is the important one, I shall hazard much and can possibly gain nothing by issue of this interview. In other words, let's think realistically what's going to be the outcome. Worst case scenario, I'm going to die. That won't be good for me. Best case scenario, I'm going to live, but my reputation will be tarnished and I might kill Aaron Burr, which would ruin my reputation, which would make me a criminal, which would make me unable to practice politics. And those are all things that happen to Aaron Burr, right? So. These, the question of duels and the legality and the morality, even from people who were participating in such activities, still made them very wary about it. And, and really, this type of duel phased out by the time of the American Civil War. You, you rarely ever see anything like a face-to-face -face duel in America after that. Now, one thing I wanted to show you uh, about the pistols those things can be very tricky to fire. So uh, we're going to, to show you a video that we'd shot before about how one of these flintlock pistols actually fire. So take a look at this and you can see that it puts out a lot of smoke and it can be somewhat unsure when it goes off. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna try to bring that back up in a second. Oh, there we go. Right, you can see in the slow mo, it's got the 
the puff back at the, the pan and the bullet coming out of the barrel. So when that big puff of smoke comes out, um, you're not exactly sure if what you've hit, but if you feel a, a ball go into you, you're certainly going to notice. Now, we've talked about what a duel is, a face-to-face -face standoff between two people with a sort of agreed upon set of rules. Is there anything you can think of that might fall into that category in American history and yet doesn't quite? Let me give you a hint. What about someone who uses one of these, right? Now, I'm dressed from the time period of Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr, that early 1800s. But if you think about it, these guns from the Old West, right? We've seen this in cowboy movies, the, the you know, the, the, the two gunfighters staring down each other in the empty street, and, and they're about to have a quick draw contest, and it's one-on-one, -on -one, right? And who's going to be the fastest draw? You don't know. Is the Old West type of shootout, is that a duel? The ones on movies and television may be somewhat of a duel, but in reality, how many of those were there actually? So something, you know, something to think about. A lot of people have compared those Old West gunfights to a duel, but are they really? Or are those what everyone was afraid would happen if it became popularized, simply, simply a brawl on the street between two people who have minor uh, disagreements and where life becomes incredibly cheap. So something to think about there. Now, I think we're going to go ahead and see if there are questions that anyone has about dueling codes and, and perhaps some instances from history. All right, so we want to know what kind of attire would they wear for a duel? Ah, so the question is what kind of attire would you wear for a duel? Um, it really depended upon the weapon. Uh, this was, remember, this was something that gentleman did. So if you are going to the duel, you're going to wear excellent clothes uh, because you're a gentleman. You want to look your best. You want to present yourself as someone who is honorable and of a social station worthy to participate in such a thing. Um, you may also, you know, if, if this is pistols, this type of clothing with the, with the traditional men's clothing of the early 1800s and even the late 1700s, it's not going to hamper my ability to use a pistol at all. If this is something where we're going to use a sword, I would very likely take off my coat. I may even take off my waistcoat here so that I would have lots of freedom of movement, right? So you're going to wear your best clothes. You're going to look the part, but when it actually comes time, um, you're going to wear whatever best suits the means of combat. All right, and when were duels outlawed? Well, duels were outlawed uh, pretty much before America even gained its independence, right? They're illegal. Uh, and for the record, kids, I've checked, they're still illegal. Uh, it's still on, on the, the federal code and, and state codes usually. But uh, again, it was, in, and in England, it was against the law. People could not duel but this was one of those understandings that um, if you were really a gentleman, if this was about honor, then the law should not get in the way of you carrying out your, your duty as a gentleman. And, and even people who were writing the laws, sort of uh, de depending upon where and when, made the laws somewhat lax because they realized that the laws are not going to stop dueling from happening. I think one person who was writing about duels uh, compared, compared it to getting married. You know, they said that uh, a duel is like, is like a marriage. The more obstacles you put between the, the two combatants, the more they're going to want to carry out the action. So um, it's been illegal for a long time and not just, um, not just against the law, but like I said, the penalties could be severe. You could be stripped of your citizenship. You could be stripped of your enfranchisement. Uh, I think, I can't remember which state, but one of the states said that if you died, this, this, was to, this was to make you not want to duel, if you died in a duel, then by law your body would basically go to science. It could be given to uh, medical students so that they could use your body for science and, and cut it up and do autopsies and things. 
that, you know, that's somewhat of a deterrent to people. If you think you're going to die and your body's going to be chopped up by those first-year medical students, you don't want that. So maybe you're going to think about maybe not dueling. But it's been illegal for a long time, but that did not stop people from doing it. And do we have, do we know what the last recorded duel was in America? Oh, uh, the last recorded duel in America. Uh, if, if I'm remembering from the book I just showed you right, and it's, I confess I have not read that in a couple of years, I want to say it was up into the 1870s. Uh, and ironically, it took place in New York. Um, and, and someone was killed as a result of that. Someone was uh, arrested for murder. Someone did go to prison for it. And it was, and you know, by that point it had, by the 1870s, especially after the carnage of the American Civil War, it wasn't even respected as a gentleman's thing anymore. That was just considered an absolute, uh, absolute waste. Now the French are a little different. I think the last um, French duel that took place took place in like the eight, in, in the 1970s uh, with swords. Uh, and they were not intent upon killing each other. They just kind of wanted to get their name in the record book. They did, they, they, it was two men who did have a disagreement. They kind of wanted to get their name in the record books, I think. So they snuck off. They even took a cameraman, right, to, to record the thing. And they fought, and they fought to first blood. So one was able to cut the other's arm. That was it. But that's, you know, that's fairly recent. That's within my lifetime. So the question is, did ladies ever duel? Yes, they did. Not nearly as frequently as the men, but there are several examples of women dueling. And it runs the gamut uh, when you look at the, the accounts from the newspapers to, uh, to the, the lower class sort getting in a fight uh, and sort of being made fun of when they do that all the way up. There are a couple of instances of ladies. Um, there's one that I'm thinking of. Now, this is in Great Britain, not in, not in the United States. But a gentleman had, um, had insulted her honor, and tradition demands that uh, someone would fight on her behalf. She refused that. She said, if my honor is the one that's been sullied, then I will be the one to put my honor on the line and redeem it. And um, they went all the way up to the point where they were meeting with pistols, and then the guy realized, you know what, I look like an idiot. There is no way I'm going to shoot at a woman. And so he apologized there in front of everyone for having said what he said about her, and that was no more. But there's at least one other instance that I can think of where two women of aristocratic uh, social class did have a pistol duel, and they, they did fire, but they both missed, and they decided that that was enough. Could young teenagers duel? How, what's the age? Uh, so the question is, you know, could teenagers duel? Was there sort of a an age limit. Uh, it, it, it depended upon time and place, again, uh, in the United States, in the young United States. You basically had to be considered a man, an adult. Uh, and, you know, what that meant, that meant you had to come from decent family. You had to have a certain socioeconomic standing. And it was somewhat, cons dueling was, was sort of, not exactly, but considered something that you would do with your peers, with your, with your equals. In other words, um, a 50-year-old man would not challenge an 18 or a 17-year-old boy to a duel, even if the boy was of, of gentlemanly standing and, you know, was self-sufficient. You just sort of didn't do that, nor, nor would the boy challenge the older man. It was something that was supposed to be done not only across social lines, but also across age uh, and, and, social, and uh, age lines and ability lines as well. So, you know, young boys, it's, it's going to be more fisticuffs kind of thing. But if it, if it did get to a point where they were, it, and many of these young boys considered it a way to pass into manhood. Well, I've fought a duel. Have you fought a duel? No? Well, then you're not a man. Oh, you're insulting me. And then here they go again. <laughs> Phil, Philip Hamilton. Oh, 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 you're talking about the, the, the actual Burr-Hamilton duel, I'm assuming. I guess so, yeah. It said, was Philip Hamilton shot before 10? Oh, the, was, was Philip Hamilton shot before 10? So the actual Hamilton-Burr duel, there's, there's still a little bit of controversy. We don't exactly know what happened. The, the best 
research that's been done to this point seems to indicate that Hamilton decided to not fire at Burr. That, that, that list of things, remember Brother Ocho, about how being in a duel was not something he wanted to do. And so it seems like at the absolute last second, he decided that he was not going to be an active, active participant in something like this. And it seems that as he was raising his pistol, he shot it into the ground. Well, when Burr sees him raise his arm, Burr immediately fires his pistol and, and hits Hamilton. I can't remember where in his body. I believe it was in his stomach. And, you know, Hamilton is carried off the field and, and dies the next day and, and spends the night in excruciating pain from the stomach wound. His family's there. His children are there. But, you know, some people have said that, that he just shot at Burr and missed. And it's something this big is, of course, going to be surrounded with a lot of legend and a lot of different perspectives from the, from the very few eyewitnesses that were there. But best we can tell, Hamilton decided at the very end that he was not going to participate in something like that. Were you allowed to try to dodge a bullet? Ah, so the question is, were you allowed to try to dodge a bullet? No, because if you were a gentleman and you were, you were there to defend your honor, a big part of a gentleman's honor was being brave. And being no, remember that, that thing that I read you, he called that man a coward. Well, if you dodge a bullet, you're considered a coward. So you have to, you have to stand there, stock still, while someone else is firing at you. That's how you prove that you are honorable. Honorable, that's how you prove that you're brave. You can't dodge or anything like that. Uh, like I said, even putting your hand over your heart here, uh, according to some practices, that was considered cowardly. So, so no, you were not allowed to dodge at all. So uh, they were referring to Alexander Hamilton's son, who also oh. apparently died in a duel. Yeah, so Alexander Hamilton's son died in a duel. Uh, I don't know if he would. I, I don't know the exact details of that duel and how that went down. I do know that it, like I said, it was three years before. It was on the exact same ground where the Hamilton Burr duel took place, and it was with the exact same set of pistols. So, you know, those, those pistols are responsible not just for the death of Alexander Hamilton, they're responsible for the death of his son as well. Speaking of pistols, if dueling pistols came in sets, did one person in the duel share his other pistol with the participant? Yes, so they would come in sets, you know, very often, both parties would come with their own set of pistols, and then the seconds would agree uh, which set would be used. Um, and then, they, like I said, they would both, at the same place, at the same time, load the pistols. And so they would share those out, but they would always use one set or the other. And sometimes they would have agreed upon whose set they were going to use beforehand. The seconds would have made all those arrangements. Um, but like I said, everyone's watching everything very closely to make sure that there's no cheating, to make sure that there's nothing awry going on. Were audiences ever invited? Oh, were audiences ever invited? No. Um, because having an audience meant you were going to have witnesses to a criminal act. And so it was usually only a very, very close set of friends. Very often, it was only the two parties, their two seconds, and perhaps a doctor and a doctor's assistant. They would, those would be the only people there. Um, and that's it, and that's how you wanted it. As a matter of fact, when the Duke of Wellington was going to have his duel with the Earl of Winchelsea, uh, they originally went to a part of Hyde Park and were about to have it, and they had to agree to relocate because there were too many people of the common sort there. And so these are, the, a duel is a very private affair. Uh, so the question is, did enslaved people ever have duels? No, they did not. Um, they were not allowed for several different reasons. Of course, socially, they could never be considered uh, gentlemen or honorable simply because of the, of the station they had been placed with their enslavement. Also, um, and again, this is set the morality aside for a second. Of course, we're, we're talking about the horrors of slavery and the idea of owning someone else. But from the ideas of the time, those slaves were property, and those slaves in the act of dueling would be endangering or destroying someone else's property. And that was very, very illegal, 
and could lead to severe punishments up to and usually including death for doing something like that. So no, enslaved people would not participate in any way in a duel. What would happen if someone was caught cheating or fired early? Ah, so what would happen if someone was caught cheating or fired early? Uh, this usually did not happen because there were so many witnesses and everything was so carefully done, but there are instances of it happening. What, so what would happen if someone fired early? Um, that person might not get shot. They may shoot the other person and the other person is not able to continue. And even if they kill that other person, their reputation is ruined. The entire point of going through, going through with a duel is moot. There's no, there's no point to have done any of it. Um, so they generally would not do that. Now, did they cheat? Sometimes yes. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of debate. Well, there's not a lot. Actually, it's not a debate. It's more of a cringe. That duel I was telling you about between Charles Dickinson and Ale excuse me, Andrew Jackson. Jackson, when he was taking his very deliberate aim, his pistol stopped at half cock, and he had to recock it and fire. By the rules of the duel, that is a very illegal act. That was supposed that that misfire was supposed to have been his shot, his chance. But rather than let that, rather than give Dickinson another chance, because remember he's already been wounded, he just reaches up, cocks it, and fires. Um, Jackson won the duel, but pretty much by any, by any measurement, that was not a very honorable act. Mm -hmm. um, would they fight, it, would they duel in bad weather? Uh, would they duel in bad weather? It depends. Uh, it depends on whether they agree to or not. Uh, the, you know, the seconds might not want to do that. If it's, a, if it's a sword duel, that's not going to affect it very much. Uh, they may want to go ahead and get it over with. If it's bad weather with, with flintlock pistols, that they're probably not going to because that's going to very much affect the operation of those pistols and make them very unreliable. So they're probably not going to continue a duel in bad weather. They would most likely postpone it until a better uh, opportunity presented itself. Were families of the one who died ever compensated financially? So we're, the question is, were families of the ones who died ever compensated financially? Um, yeah, sometimes, again, it, 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 it varies on a case-by-case -case scenario. There's one instance I'm thinking of. Um, let, me, let me back up. For example, Alexander Hamilton's wife was not compensated in any way. So Burr did not pay her money, uh, nothing like that. There's another instance that I'm thinking of, and I apologize for forgetting the, the exact details, but someone was killed who was incredibly well thought of in the community, right? And so they wanted to take care of that person's wife and their child. And so the person who had killed him in the duel offers to give her um, as much money per year as her husband was earning at his business. And the city where they lived told him that, that he could not do that. They refused to accept it because he was the one who killed them. Instead, the city would be the one to pay the annual salary to the, to the wife and to the child uh, of the man who had been killed in the duel. So there wasn't a set uh, rule about that, but sometimes, not very frequently, but sometimes it did happen. Um, we're wondering if the Hamilton Burr pistols still exist. Ah, so the question is, do the Hamilton Burr pistols still exist? Yes, they do. Lib and I were just actually talking about this. Uh, before we went live. They do still exist. Um, they're actually owned, I believe, by Chase Manhattan Bank. Uh, Libby, you may want to pull up a picture of them, sure, sure. Uh, but they're, they're really interesting. They're, they're specifically a set built to duel with, and some controversy has arisen. Yes, there they are. They're absolutely beautiful. And um, some controversy has arisen because they were looking at them um, when they were when they had purchased them and they, and they realized that there was a special trigger on these. Let me, let me pull mine up. So if you, can, if you can imagine, yeah, you can leave that up. If you can imagine, because I only need, the, yeah, I only need the, the trigger. <laughs> so the trigger on, on Hamilton's uh, pistols um, had a hair trigger on it, and it was set so that if you pushed it, if you cocked it, 
and push the trigger forward, all you had to do was just barely touch it with your finger and it would go off, right? And, but they're not sure if either one of the duelists was aware of this special detail about those pistols. And you'll see these pistols too. Um, so, so, this, so this is the original configuration. This is a flintlock mechanism. You'll notice this one has the later percussion cap mechanism. That's because the owners, before Chase Manhattan got a hold of them, decided that he needed a pistol for self-defense like in the 1850s and he had it converted to the latest type of firearm. Oh, historians hate this sort of thing and even the person who owned them very much regretted doing that later on. So we have the, the original pistols, but this part has been modified. This one is in the original configuration and as you, as you can see, they're just, they're just really neat weapons in and of themselves plus the history that's tied to them. And there's a company that has reproduced these. They reproduced a limited number back in the, I believe, the 1970s. And uh, every once in a while, they'll come up for auction. And, and, and believe me, uh, I've always looked at those. I thought they would be fascinating. But, uh, you know, historians just can't afford that kind of luxury. I can tell you that right now. Were the duels usually held in a field or what other locations might be? Uh, so the question is, where were the duels usually held? Were they usually held in a field? like the one behind me. Very often they were. The priority number one, again, was privacy. You wanted to have it in a place that was remote, where there would not be witnesses, where no one would get in the way, and where there wouldn't be something behind if, if a shot went astray that might put someone else in danger. Um, so, you know, if, if you're out in the, in the rural parts in the country, yes, a field is often the perfect place. Uh, a shade tree might be a, a great place to set up a table and load the pistols so that everyone could be in the shade before they came out into the sun uh, to perform the duel. If you were in a, excuse me, if you were in a city area or something like that, you might go into a secluded courtyard somewhere uh, where you could have the duel or in, into a uh, remote part of a park. But really, like I said, that the priority was secluded and, and private. If you could find a place like that, and as long as both parties agreed to that place, that was fine. Since duels are rare, would you buy the set of pistols before a duel or would you have them on hand? That's Okay, so that's a great question. Would, since duels were rare, would you buy the, the pistols immediately before the duel or would you just have some? Um, gentlemen tended to just have a set uh, because, you know, they're always going to need uh, some sort of firearm. They might get called up for militia duty where they would need pistols. Uh, if they're carrying some of, uh, some of their valuables from town to town, they might need to protect themselves so they would have those pistols. I, I'm calling them dueling pistols. Really, they're just a nice cased set. Uh, and we call them dueling pistols now because that's what we think of when we, when we have a match set like that. So gentlemen would usually, almost always, have their own set of pistols that could also double as dueling pistols. Uh, the, the really important part is that they be reliable, that they be accurate and that they be reliable. All right. Uh, do we have any records of uh, free black people involved in duels? Oh, the question is, do we have any records of free black people involved in duels? I don't know. I do not know the answer to that. Um, there very well may be. That's something I'm going to have to look up and check into. Uh, maybe tune in tomorrow for Ask a Historian at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard. I will do a little bit of research in, in, in the sources I have between now and then and see if I can answer that. That's actually a really good question. Were duels ever fought without weapons? Oh, the question is, were duels ever fought without weapons? Um, well, you know, d define ever in, the early, in early America, no. Because fighting it with a weapon in a very controlled way was the mark of a gentleman. That's what made a duel a duel. Um, a duel without weapons is just a barroom brawl, right? That's something, that's something the common sort can do any time and any place, and we're not going to lower ourselves to that. So, so by and large, no, it was, it was always fought with weapons. And even, you know, the idea of, of fighting, of boxing, was something that the upper classes would go watch the lower classes do as a form of entertainment, not as some sort of way to settle disputes or honor, at least amongst the gentlemen. Uh, was it ever one shot per person or did it vary from duel to duel? It varied from duel to duel based on what the, uh, the agreements were going to be. 
So let's say um, that both men came, both men fired, and both men missed. On, like not on purpose, but actually missed their opponent. Okay, so now what do we do? The seconds will talk to their men, and then the seconds will come back together, and it's again, it's basically whatever the seconds decide. The seconds may say, well, Mr. A has decided that if you're willing to apologize, there's no reason to go forward. Oh, well, really? Well, Mr. B says that he's happy to apologize and shake hands, and that's the end of it. Because they may be very glad that they've just escaped death. So they may be willing to just let, let it be and let it lie. If, they're, if their emotions are up and if their blood is up, they may want to keep going. And if they want to keep going, then they will just load those pistols again and do it all over again. Um, and generally speaking, uh, once someone was struck, that was the end of the duel. Now, I can think of one instance where uh, one person shot at one, he missed, the other one shot at him, gave him a slight wound, and he was so upset that he hadn't got the guy, he said, let's go again. And they did, and he ended up, ended up getting killed. So again, these, uh, we, we keep saying rules, but it was really sort of almost anything goes as long as the two parties agree to it beforehand. Uh, so why were the, the helpers called seconds, and did they ever stand in? Um, they were called seconds because they were the second man, the, 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 the party of the first part, right, the aggrieved, and then the party of the, of the second part. So it was their second. Sometimes they did. Uh, if The idea was if something happened to the primary, the, the, the person who was aggrieved or who had given the insult, then it was up to the second to stand in their stead. Um, that, that was the point. It, that was sort of the last resort. The second was really supposed to just be the, the go-between, the interlocutor. Now, sometimes there were so many aggrieved parties at play that, that you know, if, there's, if party A and B are trying to settle a dispute and they send their seconds and the seconds get really, really upset at each other, it could become... Uh, a, a two-way duel, or I should say a four-way duel, right? So you would have party A and party B here facing off, and then you would have party C and D over here, and they would make sort of an X, and in the very middle they would put a handkerchief so you would know where the middle was, and everyone would take their paces out from that handkerchief, and then they would need someone else there to give the signal, and then all four of them would fire at the same, at the same time at the party across. These were incredibly rare, but some of the uh, more detailed code books about the duel do include this, this kind of circumstance and do give some of the guidelines for it. But it was very, very rare that such a thing would take place. All right, that was our last question. All right, folks, uh, thank you so much for tuning in. This is a fascinating topic. Uh, we could go into so much more, but we're going to go ahead and let it go. Uh, tomorrow's uh, episode of Ask a Historian, it seems like we've already got one question. I know we have another one. Uh, from, from a previous thing, so we're going to do that tomorrow at 2. And we are so excited to let you all know that we have finally made live our digital memberships. If you're enjoying this content and you want to keep it coming into your home for distance learning, for homeschool, or just for pure entertainment and fun, we've got a way to do that now. With things hopefully settling out soon, we're going to be opening our real doors open uh, back to the public. We want to make sure we can keep all of our great new folks connected. So we're going to have digital memberships where you'll have access to all the content we've been doing, plus new content every week. And you can, uh, I think Lib has put the, the link in the chat. You can go to that. It's only going to be $3 a month or $35 for the year. So click on that. It helps support us here, and it's going to keep these great programs coming straight to you. So. With that in mind, thank you all so much for joining us today. We'll see you tomorrow, but until then, stay safe, take care.